Welcome back, Social 20-1. Today we're going to look at the Cold War as a more intense study in the consequences of nationalism and ideology. Cold War can be divided into distinctive phases. 1945 to 47, we'll talk about the origins of the Cold War. 1947 to 53, we'll talk about containment. From 53 to 62, we'll talk about coexistence. From 62 to 79, we'll talk about detente. 79 to 85, we'll talk about confrontation. And then finally, revolution. Here we go. The 1940s. The origins of the Cold War. In addition to the notes I provided for you in the last lesson, here's some more look at the origins of the Cold War. It can be seen generally from the conferences at the end of World War II, where the seeds of this conflict were planted. We're going to look specifically at Yalta and Potsdam. Here's the big three at Yalta. You have Churchill of the United Kingdom, FDR from America, and Stalin from the Soviet Union. And they look very friendly. But it's at Yalta that distrust between the wartime allies begins to grow. They agreed on the structure of the German and Berlin zones of occupation. There would be three zones of occupation. The Soviets would have a zone of occupation in the east, the Americans and British in the west. The American and British zones would be further subdivided to provide the French with a zone of occupation as well. They agreed to set up the United Nations to replace the League of Nations. So there was some growth there, but the Soviets promised to enter the war against Japan within three months of an Allied victory in Europe that actually occurs in May of 45. The Soviets were to be granted a sphere of influence in Manchuria in some Japanese territory. Germany was required to pay reparations in equipment, goods, and labor, although this was never imposed. The Allies could not agree on what the government would be recognized in Poland. And FDR does die shortly after the conference, replaced by Henry S. Truman as president. Henry S. Truman personally will conflict with Stalin. So what do we see from this, this conference? We're seeing that at this conference, they're trying to look at the new world order after the war. And uh, we're seeing a desire from the Soviets to have a buffer zone. And we're seeing some lack of unity in terms of what to do with Germany. Now we have Potsdam and we have Harry S. Truman there instead of FDR now. And at Potsdam, the Allies could not agree on which government represented the Poles. The London Polish government exiled in Britain favored by the West or the Lublin government favored by the Soviets. The Allies discussed conduct of war with Japan but concealed the atomic bomb secret. So even while they're meeting, there were some secrets. Soviets knew about the Manhattan Project um, through espionage. But being that their allies weren't sharing this information with them, the seeds of discontent were growing. The Soviets had not yet declared war on Japan. The Soviets will regain control of Port Arthur, the Manchurian railway system, and the southern half of Sakhalin Island, lost in the 0405 Russo-Japanese War. They agreed to allow American and British militaries to administer the western sphere of influence, the Soviet Union to administer the eastern sphere, thereby adopting or creating a bipolar world, the first and the second world, the developed westernized liberal world against the second communist world. Churchill is replaced by Clement Attlee, the leader of the Labour Party, which had defeated Churchill's Conservative Party in the election held during the conference. So that's some of the seeds of discontent, the seeds that are, are shaping them. But nobody had really like identified that there's this division until Churchill delivers this famous Iron Church, Iron Curtain speech. So less than a half. Less than a year after the end of World War II, the wartime leader of Britain, Winston Churchill, delivered a speech that popularized the term Iron Curtain to describe the line in Europe between self-governing countries, the liberal Western democracies, and countries in Eastern Europe under communist Soviet control. The Iron Curtain became a metaphor for the division between American and Soviet ideologies. This is, the Cold War is a war of ideologies. It's a war where there's two worlds, us and them, and one world is on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And Because we can't see through the curtain, we can only um, become more paranoid and suspicious about what they're up to. And here's his famous quote. 
and you can see that he, he makes a list of uh, popular cities in, in Eastern Europe. He's talking about how the people on the other side of that line in the Soviet sphere are all subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasingly measure of control from Moscow. So Truman needs to respond, and he's going to respond with the Truman Doctrine. And the Truman Doctrine is fitting into the Marshall Plan. It fits into containment. This idea that we cannot allow communism to spread any further. So the United States framed its, its expansionism in terms of providing other countries with the freedom to choose sides or defending their freedom to choose a governing ideology. Uh, these reasons for extending American influence were described in the Truman Doctrine in 1947 in which President Harry S. Truman called upon the United States to support free peoples resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. So we have this idea of the United States, they're not going to retreat back into isolationism like they did at the end of World War I. We need to take an active role in preventing the spread of communism, containing the spread of communism. We're going to do that through the CIA when necessary in, in uh, Italy. We're going to use the CIA to help fund those opponents of communism to help win that election. We're going to use the CIA elsewhere in Latin America. We're also going to use the power of the U.S. dollar through the Marshall Plan to, to lend money, to loan money, to give money to some people to help rebuild their economies so to prevent them from turning to economic extremism. And all of this is a part of containing the dominoes. We, each time one country falls, it puts pressure on neighboring countries. So the domino theory of not allowing any country to fall, each one is like a domino that puts pressure on the next one. The domino theory, containment, Truman Doctrine, uh, Marshall Plan, it's all about being active. The American foreign policy actively trying to stop the spread of communism. In post-war Europe and around the world, countries were making exactly the choices that Truman described. Truman wanted to stop Soviet expansionism to contain the communist influence and rather than resorting to a hot war, which includes troops against troops in battles and direct conflict, the United States fought its ideological conflict by creating alliances and giving aid Marshall Plan, among other methods. For example, the United States responded with $400 million in aid when the post-war Greek and Tur Turkish governments asked for support in defeating the appeal of communism in their countries. So how do we stop communism from spreading and getting access down to the Mediterranean? Do we go to war against the communists in Turkey and Greece, or do we just provide some aid? $400 million while invested. There's the Marshall Plan. Whatever the weather, we must move together. So we're talking about you know, an evolution away from just American nationalism to this idea that the Americans are beginning to understand that they need to work with other nations because they have common problems. The Marshall Plan was a $13 billion plan to help the recovery of countries ravaged by war in Europe. This offer was for all countries of Europe, communist or democratic. The $13 billion Marshall Plan would be over $100 billion in today's currency. Over the lifespan of the Marshall Plan, 47 to 52, 17 countries in Europe received funds and technical expertise from the United States. U.S. aid to post-war Europe was offered to all European countries, but did have some strings attached, such as conditions related to economic policies. Therefore, the Soviets considered this to be dollar imperialism and spoke on behalf of the Eastern European countries and said no. And that's why European countries in the East tend to be a little poorer now than the West because they didn't get this rebuilt at the end of the war. Soviet Union maintains a sphere of influence over the Eastern Europe throughout the Cold War era. Uh, these Eastern European countries are often referred to as satellite states. So Moscow had Eastern Europe buffer zone, and, and those capitals in Eastern Europe, often they would look back to Moscow for its leadership. So in Poland, which was a part of the Eastern sphere of influence, uh, Warsaw, the capital of Poland, would often take direction from Moscow. And we see that here. So it really is a bipolar world in East versus West. The United States' allies are in Western Europe, France, United Kingdom, West Germany, Spain, eventually, um, Portugal. And the Soviet Union's allies are the occupied ones in the East. So the Soviet Union, the Red Army, liberated Poland and Romania and Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia from the, so from the Nazis. And then the Red Army just didn't go home. The Red Army occupied them and continued to build them in the image of the Soviet Union. 
city of Berlin was well within the Soviet zone of occupation and would be the scene of the first true test of wills in the Cold War. The Soviets tried to cut West Berlin off from the rest of Eastern Europe, sorry, Western Europe. The city was blockaded. So the people, 800,000 people living in West Berlin, uh, they need supplies from outside West Berlin to survive. The Allies needed to break the, break the blockade, but they didn't want to run the blockade along the ground and risk war. They flew over the blockade in what they saw as international air channels. And every 90 seconds, a plane dropped goods into the city to keep those people um, supplied. So it was a joint American-British um, air survival mission. The Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift will be 1948-1949. Also during the 40s, by the way, a part of that bipolar world, um, that NATO will uh, be formed in 1949 as an alliance against the expanding threat of the Soviet Union. Now let's jump to the 1950s. Significant events in the 1950s, obviously the Korean War, right? 50 to 53. Something of note here, though, it is the United States intervening with the UN uh, to um, liberate South Korea from North Korean aggression, and then they go and invade North Korea to try to neutralize that threat in the future. And at times, the Americans and the UN forces will fight Chinese forces, but very few Russian or Soviet forces will be a part of the battle. How did we get to this point? Well, much like Europe was divided at the end of World War II, a part of it was denazified by the Soviets, a part of it denazified by the Americans, so too was the Korean Peninsula, and this time the north of the 38th parallel was occupied by the Soviets to eliminate Japanese presence, and south of 38th was occupied by the Americans, and although the plan wasn't originally for two separate nations to be formed, that was the consequence of the occupation. Now, how does it become a UN mission in the Korean War? Well, basically, the uh, UN mission is, is a part of the UN Security Council. The Soviet ambassador was vetoing the Security Council, um, was protesting the Security Council, because the Security Council ch uh, seat that was meant to go to China went to Taiwan instead of China. So as a protest against who the UN recognized as quote-unquote China, then the Security Council only had the United States, Britain, and France on the fateful day when they voted to go to armed intervention to save South Korea. Now, in terms of the UN, had they not been able to respond to the growing aggression of North Korea against South Korea, then the UN's litmus test here, uh, will it suffer the same fate as North Korea, would, or sorry, as the League of Nations would have been lost. So they end up having the ability to send in troops to liberate South Korea, and this was something the League of Nations failed to do. So the UN does pass this litmus test, but only because the Russians had been boycotting because the Chinese seat had gone to Taiwan. So there has been um, a formal armistice signed, but uh, no permanent cease has been created yet. Therefore, a DMZ still separates South and North Korea today. And interestingly enough, along that DMZ, along the 38th parallel here, um, some of the animals are, are living their best lives because the lack of... of um, human presence. Now, in 1956, we have the Hungarian Revolution. And interesting to note, the leader in uh, the Soviet Union at this time is a, is a new leader. Uh, it's it's um, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev. And Nikita Khrushchev will be remembered for saying peaceful coexistence. Nikita Khrushchev will also be remembered domestically for trying to de-Stalinize the Soviet Union. So there's moments of Nikita Khrushchev's resume that you look at and say, well, this is someone we can work with. You know, he's not saying that, like Lenin, that we cannot live peacefully aside each other. But at the same time, in 1956, when the Hungarians uh, declare that they'd like the Red Army to go home, what does Khrushchev do? He sends in the tanks and crushes Hungary. This is the Warsaw Pact invading itself, right? This is a gang that invades itself now. Do some quick notes on the Hungarian uprising. <laughs>
1957, lots of great things are happening for the Soviet Union. They're in space with Sputnik. So Sputnik is going to be kind of an alarming situation for the Americans. We're falling behind. Our rockets are disintegrating on the launch pads. They're in space. Uh, the space race is a manifestation of the arms race. Arms race is a way for the two systems to compete against each other. How do we know our system is better than theirs? Well, we're in space and you're not. And the rockets that we sent uh, a man into space with, or a satellite in space with, with Sputnik, um, these same rockets could probably send nukes your way as well. So there's lots of levels to the space race. 1960s. We have the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. This is uh, in the first months of President Kennedy's administration. And uh, the CIA plans with ex-Cuban nationals an invasion of Cuba to... Um, basically topple the pro-Moscow government uh, under Fidel Castro and to get Cuba back into the American sphere of influence. Unfortunately for the CIA and America's allies invading Cuba, it's a rout against us. The uh, Cuban soldiers under Fidel Castro are waiting for us on the beaches of the Bay of Pigs and it, without the uh, air um, coverage, the, the Cubans, the ex-Cubans that are trying to liberate Cuba get destroyed. Here's Fidel, looking all dapper, I guess. So this is going to only make the relations between Cuba and America even worse, and it's going to lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis because the Soviets are going to agree with the Cubans that the Cubans need more ability to support themselves. They need nukes. The Berlin Wall is built in 1961 and is often seen as the manifestation of the Cold War in Europe, dividing East and West Berlin. 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. Here's some historical background for you, including the aforementioned Bay of Pigs. It's often referred to as the uh, you know 13 days at the brink of nuclear war. The Americans had some U-2 spy plane footage showing that the Soviet ballistic missiles had been installed on the island and the American military gave President Kennedy some options. You know, we could have a limited airstrike against Cuba, we need to invade Cuba, and uh, this is our chance to topple the government. Uh, it did look like war was inevitable. Here are the choices. Do nothing, ignore them, bomb the missiles, blockade Cuba, don't let anything in. Uh, try to solve this through diplomacy. This is what they take. All ships open to search within 500 miles. So they do a naval blockade. And they only are able to do a naval blockade by having every other country in the Western Hemisphere other than Cuba agree to it. So all the Americas except for Cuba agreed to this, this uh, naval blockade. Otherwise, a naval blockade is an act of war. It's also going to be some negotiations between the two superpowers. Uh, through the UN and in the UN the United States is going to be presenting very specific photos Challenging the Soviet claim that there are no nukes there Here are the results So there will be cooler heads prevail the missiles will be dismantled the Americans will also agree to dismantle Their Jupiter missiles in Turkey although those missiles were obsolete and scheduled for dismantling anyways the Americans will also commit to never invading Cuba, and that's a pretty big commitment because they'd invaded them 13 times in the century leading up to this. And uh, they said, you know what, we need to work on our communication. So they established a hotline between the two countries. 1963, we're going to move on to the Vietnam War. This is a part of that uh, domino theory, the containment. Now communism is spread from North Korea and in the Soviet Union into China and China into North Vietnam. Now North Vietnam wants to take South Vietnam. If South Vietnam falls, then Laos falls, then Cambodia falls, then India falls, then the Middle East falls, then Italy and France falls, and then eventually America falls. We need to stop the dominoes. We've seen some of those concepts in the previous video. All right, just clicking ahead a little bit. Let's go to, oh, key players. Here's some people we've seen so far. And those are some events we've looked at so far.
We're going to see the second half of this conflict in the next video. So the next video, we'll look at detente to the end of the Cold War.